Okay, doctors, we're on to our next lecture, which is, the topic is hernia. Again, Dr. Singer. Okay, thank you. Here are my disclosures. Okay, this next section will be on uh, hernia, a variety of hernias. You see the topics listed here. Uh, we'll start with <clears throat> abdominal wall hernias. Uh, these are familiar to you all. We'll just remind ourselves of the uh, sort of common anterior abdominal wall hernias, epigastric, umbilical, incisional. In the uh, picture on the right, you see the inguinal hernias, direct and indirect, and femoral, and also the semilunar or spigalian hernia. Of course, we have to just do a very brief review of the anatomy, looking at the layers of the anterior abdominal wall and cross section um, up above the costal margin um, everything is uh, sort of the anterior uh, external oblique uh, just the one layer and then in the upper abdomen you have uh, both anterior and posterior that's above the arcuate line below the arcuate line everything <clears throat> again becomes anterior anterior to the rectus muscles um, we'll talk more about inguinal hernia, but uh, reminding ourselves of some of the anatomy of the, the groin, uh, the inguinal triangle or Hesselbach triangle, that's one of the structures you should definitely remember. You see it here in black. You should know the borders. So the rectus muscle medially, the epigastric uh, vessels at the top, and the inguinal ligament at the bottom. Uh, this is clinically important because that's the place where people will develop direct hernias. That's the floor of the canal. People will get direct hernias in Hesselbach's triangle. Um, again, just a review of the layers of the abdominal wall. Uh, really the same structure as I'll point out here. Again, the semilunar line, which is really, or the spigalian line, just the lateral border of the rectus. Again, important because of the spigalian hernia, which we'll talk about, but occurs at that line. Um, laparoscopic view, uh, important, of course, because laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair uh, has become common. So this is the view from the uh, intraperitoneal perspective. Um, and um, we'll talk more uh, about that as we talk about laparoscopic repair. The inguinal canal, for those of you who are doing hernia surgery, you know this anatomy very well. For those of us who no longer do hernia surgery, it's always confusing but you, you really need to think of the inguinal canal in sort of three dimensions. Um, it's, it's not a flat structure, but a dynamic structure. The two, uh, the, uh, the two rings make up sort of the, the front and back of it. And then, of course, uh, the sides of the, the box, as some people describe it. Uh, the superior wall is a combination of the internal oblique and the transversus abdominis. Um, the, the roof or the anterior aspect is going to be the amponeurosis of the external oblique. The floor is going to be the transversalis fascia. Remembering that's really what the hernia, um, the direct hernia is a defect in the transversalis fascia, the floor, the canal, and then inferiorly the inguinal ligament. Um, knowing the contents of the inguinal canal um, is important um, because common questions include uh, scenarios of injury to the, uh, the contents of the spermatic cord and the contents of the canal and the resulting defects. So to remind ourselves, in men, uh, the canal includes the spermatic cord and its coverings and the ilioinguinal nerve, the ilioinguinal nerve. In women, uh, it's the round ligament and the ilioinguinal nerve. This one comes up commonly, uh, injury to the ilioinguinal nerve and that results in sensory defect of the medial uh, thigh and scrotum in men and in women of uh, the labia. So that's not uncommon to be asked that. Now the description of the contents of the canal in men, you should know in a little bit more detail. Um, so here you see all the structures listed. Um, the arteries, like the artery to the vas, the testicular artery, and the cremasteric artery. These, of course, are very tiny, and you don't even really see them as distinct structures. Uh, the fascial layers, the external spermatic, internal spermatic, and the cremasteric. Uh, 
other three other vessels, the pampiniform plexus, the vas deferens, of course, that you need to know for sure, and then the lymphatic bundle. And then one nerve going through is the genital branch of the genital femoral nerve. Okay, so question, a case study about inguinal hernia. 45-year-old cocaine addict, an alcoholic, presents with a three-day history of an incarcerated left inguinal hernia. There's significant pain and erythema over the bulge in the left inguinal region. The patient appears toxic in the operating room, and a necrotic segment of sigmoid colon with fecal spillage is found within the hernia. The most appropriate approach would be Sigmoid resection and primary anastomosis with mesh hernia repair. Sigmoid resection and primary anastomosis with suture-based hernia repair. Laparotomy, Hartman's procedure with synthetic mesh repair. Laparotomy, Hartman's procedure with suture-based repair. Laparotomy with sigmoid resection and anastomosis and preperitoneal hernia repair. Take a moment to review those choices. Okay, good. So uh, the large majority chose laparotomy, Hartman's, and suture-based repair. So I think this kind of question um, typifies the, the type of questions regarding hernia uh, the details of what type of suture you use and what type of mesh you use are not nearly so important as things like patient selection and the principles of how you're going to manage it. This patient is not a well guy. He's on cocaine and he's toxic. He has a dead colon with stool. This is not somebody who gets an anastomosis. Maybe in real life you can do that and maybe it's fine, but in this setting he does not ever get an anastomosis. That's number one. Number two, there's fecal spillage. Don't give that guy a mesh. Yes, it might be possible. Maybe you can wash it out adequately, treat it with antibiotics, whatever kind of thing you might do. But in this setting, when there's stool, don't give that guy a mesh. Maybe you're not comfortable doing a suture-based hernia repair. That's okay because you don't need to know how to do it. You need to know the proper management, no mesh. So that's really sort of the take-home of this kind of thing. Now, talking about hernias, what what are the risk factors for hernias? Well, anything that's going to increase the pressure inside the abdomen. So obesity, heavy lifting, that includes things like weightlifters and, you know, uh, extreme athletes. Patients who have chronic coughing, usually related to COPD. Patients who have uh, chronic constipation or uh, prostate issues that are straining all the time to defecate or urinate. Patients with ascites. Patients with peritoneal dialysis, that's sort of like having ascites. Same with a VP shunt, they have increased pressure. And then, like everything, family history, of course, a risk factor. Complications of untreated hernias. So, of course, we worry about incarceration. And just to remind ourselves of the, the nomenclature, incarceration is when the contents cannot be reduced. Strangulation is when uh, they become ischemic. Obstruction uh, is the complication that we often will see uh, when patients have an incarcerated and or strangulated hernia uh, and they get a mechanical obstruction. So who needs their hernia repaired? Uh, certainly symptoms will drive most of this. Patients get a lot of pain and discomfort from hernias. They deserve to have it fixed. Patients have a hernia that's enlarging over time uh, before it gets too far out of control. They should get it fixed preventing complications, as we just mentioned, like obstruction and strangulation. People who have jobs uh, that become difficult to do because of uh, the hernia, people who are lifting, straining, you know, working in warehouses, whatever kind of thing it is, and they can't do it because they can't lift objects, they should have their hernia fixed. Um, but in truth, not everybody should get their hernia fixed. And we know this from a large um, cooperative study showing that with uh, patients who have minimally or asymptomatic inguinal hernias, the risk of incarceration was 1.8 per 1,000 patient years. It's actually a very small number, but bear in mind, these are patients with asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic hernias. Um, so it is safe. In those people, it's safe to just uh, observe and wait until they become symptomatic or if they become symptomatic. <clears throat> 
Um, general principles of hernia repair. This is true for really all uh, types of hernias, reducing the contents, dissecting the hernia sac, ligating the sac, and repairing the defect. So when it comes to ing uh, inguinal hernia, there's, of course, a lot of different kinds of repair. Here you see some of the uh, traditional suture-based repair. Um, uh, next, you see the mesh-based repair. These have mostly replaced the suture repairs, but we do need to be familiar with the suture repairs because of, uh, like that case that we opened with, there's still a, a defined role for them. The Lichtenstein tension-free mesh repair has is, is become the most popular. And then also laparoscopic mesh repair, and whether you use the TAP, uh, transabdominal approach or TEP, extraperitoneal approach, I think for the purposes of this exam usually doesn't matter too much. We'll talk a bit about inguinal uh, hernia repair. We'll remind ourselves of the suture repair, the Bassini repair that you see here. Um, and basically you're just suturing the internal oblique uh, to the inguinal ligament. That's kind of the easiest way to think about it. You should be familiar with this for that specific reason, if you're presented with a case of gross contamination, infection, stool, etc., you should know how to do one of these. Again, the very fine details of what suture to use and that kind of stuff, not as important for this. Also be familiar with the Cooper's ligament or McVeigh repair. Um, and this is a, a suture repair in which you secure the conjoined tendon to the Cooper's ligament and you go, uh, and that's sort of at the medial, and you extend it laterally uh, to, uh, out to the femoral canal. So th this one is helpful mostly because you can use it for a femoral hernia, and we'll talk more about that. But the McVeigh or Cooper's ligament is a good choice for the femoral hernia. As mentioned, these have been largely replaced by the Lichtenstein tension-free mesh repair. Again, the kind of mesh, most people are using polypropylene, but the brand and exact configuration, that stuff not as important. You're securing it medially uh, to the pubic tubercle, suturing it to the inguinal ligament. You are recreating the uh, ring, the external ring here, with the tails of the mesh. Those are kind of the things you need to remember. And here you see, uh, we talked about a suture uh, Cooper ligament or McVeigh repair, you can also repair that with mesh, um, and that's going to be helpful for femoral hernia repair. Here you see medial to the iliacs, the femoral hernia. Okay, laparoscopic hernia repair. So during laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair, placement of the tacks in the triangle bordered by the vas deferens and the spermatic vessels may result in groin pain, bleeding, poor mesh incorporation, urinary incontinence, or hernia recurrence. So tax in the triangle bordered by the vas deferens and spermatic vessels. Okay, divided answers here. So bleeding is the answer we're looking for, bleeding. So that's the so-called triangle of doom. So we already looked at the Hesselbach triangle where the direct hernias occur, but from this perspective, from the intraperitoneal perspective, if you were doing laparoscopy, this is how you would see things. And the triangle of doom is bordered by the vas here, um, by the uh, spermatic vessels here, and the iliacs down here. And so putting tacks right in here, you can see you're right over the iliac vessels. Not good. That's where the massive bleeding will come from. Triangle of doom. Okay, so is laparoscopic hernia repair a good thing to do? Uh, some of the pros and cons. Uh, many people would advocate this approach for bilateral hernias because you can access both sides, of course. Recurrent hernias, if they've had a, a perhaps an open mesh or suture repair. Um, previously, there's going to be uh, scarring and the planes will be obscured and this will allow approach from posteriorly. Uh, so it can be helpful for recurrent and also for femoral hernias. Um, as we saw in that other illustration, you can apply a mesh uh, directly over the uh, femoral site. 
um, benefits, earlier return to normal activity, less pain, although that's not entirely clear. Uh, there's data, I think, supporting both open and laparoscopic hernia in terms of pain. Drawbacks, so the cons, um, OR time and expense of equipment, and usually the need for general anesthesia uh, compared to um, doing an open inguinal hernia. Complications um, from inguinal hernia repair, vascular injury, we talked about that, um, especially if you're doing laparoscopy. Remember, triangle of doom, a tack into the triangle of doom will give you I iliac bleeding. Uh, bowel injury, prosthetic complications like mesh, uh, migration, erosion, infection. Uh, pain, cord injuries, review the structures of the cord and know the associated injuries, bladder injury, and then infection, seroma, the usual stuff. Now, how about treating recurrent inguinal hernias? A case to uh, uh, highlight some of that stuff. Tension-free hernia repair most typically will recur at what aspect of the inguinal canal? The internal ring, the inferomedial aspect, lateral to the mesh, at the conjoined tendon, or directly through the mesh? Okay, great. So after some, after a patient has a uh, Lichtenstein tension-free hernia repair, the recurrence almost always is at the inferomedial aspect, and we'll look at that in a minute. Uh, problems with inguinal hernia repair, um, wound healing problems. These are issues for any operation you're doing, but you know diabetes and risk of infection and poor healing, malnutrition, infection, especially if you're using a prosthetic mesh. Ascites um, is a risk factor for not just leakage through your wound, but recurrence of hernia, patients who are immunosuppressed, and those who smoke. Smoking is a huge risk factor for recurrent hernia, not just inguinal, but all hernias. Some technical issues to consider, um, whether you're repairing the direct or the indirect hernia, make sure you assess for the opposite one. Failure to um, identify that uh, can be a problem. Tension, uh, of course the suture repairs are all tension repairs and the mesh uh, should be a tension free repair. <laughs> Failure to reinforce the inferomedial aspect, so that's uh, the so called classic recurrence after the tension free repair. Um, it's always at that location, that's sort of the vulnerable point of that repair. Uh, failure to seat the mesh properly during the laparoscopic repair, of course that's true of any uh, laparoscopic hernia repair. Um, failure to do high ligation of the sac, failure to tighten the inguinal ring. Again, with the tension-free mesh repair, it's important to recreate the ring with the tails of the mesh and put them snugly uh, around the cord. Treating a recurrent inguinal hernia, as mentioned, laparoscopic approach has uh, become common because you can stay away from the anterior space where there's a, a big crumpled up mesh or scar tissue and you can't identify the planes, uh, so you can just go behind it all. The stopa repair, um, using a large overlapping mesh uh, or plug and patch, which will uh, adequately uh, address both the inguinal, I'm sorry, the direct and indirect uh, hernias at the same time. A few words about femoral hernia. 78 year old woman undergoes a small bowel resection for strangulated segment of small bowel in, the, in a femoral hernia. After returning the bowel into the abdominal cavity, what repair would be most appropriate? A Bassini repair. Shouldeis repair, Cooper's ligament or McVeigh, iliopubic tract repair, or tension-free mesh-based repair. Terrific. Cooper's ligament repair, McVeigh repair. So again, uh, don't don't worry too much about uh, types of sutures. How many? what kind of mesh, this kind of stuff. This is a patient with a strangulated uh, hernia. She's got uh, concern for infection, so you wanna do a suture repair. In the Cooper's ligament or McVeigh repair, even if you don't know how to do it, that's your safe choice for a femoral hernia. So femoral hernias are more common in women. Usually this is, uh, you're gonna see an old, uh, frail woman. That's who typically presents with femoral hernia. It will present as a groin lump. Um, but it's a little bit different than the um, incarcerated inguinal hernia. It's going to be lower 
Um, imagine the line between the anterior superior iliac spine and the pubic tubercle, and the femoral hernia will be below that. Um, diagnosis usually clinical, uh, and it always requires surgical repair. Again, Cooper's ligament or McVeigh, um, but also can be done with a mesh repair if it's a clean case. Umbilical hernia, um, so this more common in uh, women, the precipitating or risk factor is similar to inguinal hernia. Um, diagnosis on physical exam, also CT can be helpful in assessing uh, the contents of it and the, the size of the defect. Contents usually are going to be omentum, always going to be some preperitoneal fat, and then often some bowel. You can fix these either with uh, direct suture repair or mesh repair, which is usually uh, going to be the preferred approach. Um, incisional hernia, now this has become the most common type of ventral hernia. Um, uh, it affects both men and women equally. Uh, incidence after uh, previous surgery is variable. It depends on what operation they had and where their incision was. Midline uh, laparotomies are going to have a higher rate of hernia compared to off midline, fan and steel, transverse, muscle splitting inf uh, incisions. Uh, midline laparotomy, definitely the highest. Um, Postoperative infection is going to be a very high uh, risk factor for, post for subsequent hernia. Usually these are going to form within a year, but as you know, it's really sort of a lifetime risk. Ventri or incisional hernias can be repaired primarily. Uh, these have a very high rate of recurrence. So you can bear in mind somewhere around 50% recurrence. Again, in contaminated cases, unstable patients, you're doing a very messy bowel resection, stuff like that, it's okay to do a primary repair in that setting, understanding 50% recurrence. Mesh repair, significantly lower between one and nine. Uh, obviously, there's a ton of literature on this, and it depends on what mesh you're using and what space you put it in, uh, but clearly lower than primary repair. If you do do a, uh, a mesh repair, um, you can use either synthetic uh, mesh, polypropylene, uh, PTFE, all these uh, different uh, products, or biologic, um, like acellular dermis and similar products. Um, the biologic uh, would be appropriate to use in a contaminated field. Uh, synthetics should be used in clean cases. Again, there are instances and some data supporting the use of synthetic mesh in a contaminated field, but in general, be as safe as you can be, and for the purpose of this exam, don't put polypropylene mesh into contaminated fields. You want to use either suture repair or consider a biologic, which should be more resistant to infection. Uh, component release, sometimes this sort of comes up, as you see in this cartoon, sometimes if you cannot close the midline, releasing the external oblique will afford you several centimeters of mobility on either side. In extreme cases, uh, tissue expanders can be used. And of course, laparoscopic repair for incisional or umbilical hernia. Um, and again, uh, you can use uh, the mesh of your choice. And just remember the important principles of wide overlay of the defect and uh, frequent uh, tacking or suturing uh, around the periphery. Okay, just a few miscellaneous hernias. The spigalian hernia, relatively rare, but comes up on these exams from time to time. This occurs at the spigalian line, semilunar line. That's um, the space just lateral to the uh, rectus. And um, you see it here poking through. These will present as a, a bulge. Um, physical exam can be unreliable, especially if the patient is obese, uh, and not even massively obese, but even just a little obese. These are hard to detect, um, and so imaging like CT scan becomes important. Some of the things to remember, uh, the Hauship romberg sign, uh, this is one way you can help uh, make a diagnosis without directly palpating the um, uh, hernia. Sorry, we've moved on to obturator hernias. My apologies. Um, that's a physical exam uh, finding where you're going to uh, flex the hip and rotate it internally, and that will uh, cause exacerbate obturator nerve compression and give the patient pain. These defects are generally small, and so patients are at risk of getting a Richter's hernia. Uh, that's the one where. Um, the full thickness of the small ball doesn't enter the hernia, but just the partial, uh, the wall of it does, and still can create an obstruction. These patients are, should be treated surgically. 
um, with uh, uh, open repair, put them in steep trendelenburg to get the ball out of the pelvis. Usually you have to incise the obturator membrane to release the hernia and then do a mesh repair. Uh, okay, that's it about hernias. Questions about that? Again, I would emphasize understand the anatomy of the inguinal um, triangle, Hesselbox triangle, the inguinal canal, and the principles of suture versus mesh repair. Don't be too hung up on the, you know, if a Bassini or a McVeigh or Scholdeis repair is the best one. That's not usually the question you're going to be asked to differentiate those kinds of things. Okay, thanks very much.